Hello everyone and welcome in CardioMinds YouTube channel and we are still in the topic of cardiovascular prevention guidelines and today we are having a video regarding risk factors of cardiovascular disease. We have a famous classification of risk factors into being non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. When we speak about non-modifiables, the first one that comes in our mind is age, which is a major driver, of course, of cardiovascular disease risk. When you speak about men less than 40 years or women less than 50 years old, they are almost invariably at low 10-year cardiovascular risk. But put in your mind that they may have unfavorable modifiable risk factor like for example type 1 diabetes mellitus or familial hyperlipidemia that may significantly increase the longer term cardiovascular risk. So it is a general rule but it has some exceptions. Whereas in men older than 65 or women older than 75 year old they are almost always at high 10 year cardiovascular risk. That's why we consider age as a major driver of cardiovascular risk as a patient ages. But it is of course a non-modifiable risk factor. Also put in your mind that age ranges may differ according to men and women as we mentioned here that the cutoff point were different in gender and geographical region of course is a major contributor because some age ranges may have higher cardiovascular risk in a specific country in comparison to another. But in this video we are going to focus on the modifiable risk factors because this is the target of the guidelines this year to help for risk factor control which would reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in the general population. They include cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetes mellitus and adiposity which is the same terminology for obesity. Let's start with cholesterol. We chose the word cholesterol itself rather than hyperlipidemia in order to specify the specific role of cholesterol on the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We all know that the prolonged lower LDL cholesterol is associated with lower risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, especially when the LDL is reached below 55 mg per deciliter, which is a target according to the latest guidelines of hyperlipidemia in patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And the relative reduction in cardiovascular risk is directly proportional to the absolute size of the reduction of the LDL cholesterol irrespective of the medications used to achieve this reduction. So we can say that the benefit of lowering LDL cholesterol depends on the absolute risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as a baseline status and the degree of reduction in LDL cholesterol. So we can conclude that even a small absolute reduction in LDL cholesterol may be beneficial in high or very high risk patients. So don't ignore any degree of reduction in LDL cholesterol. It will get a benefit, but we try to have the optimal benefit. We usually use in the guidelines the terminology of non-HDL cholesterol, which includes all atherogenic or ABOB containing lipoprotein, and is calculated from this equation, which is total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol equals the non-HDL cholesterol. And the relationship between non-HDL cholesterol and the cardiovascular risk is as strong as the relationship with LDL cholesterol. That's why sometimes we use non-HDL cholesterol as a surrogate target rather than LDL cholesterol, especially in those with marked hypertriglyceridemia. That's why non-HDL cholesterol is used as a marker in the SCORE2 algorithm and SCORE2 older persons algorithm. What about the HDL cholesterol? Does it still have a prognostic impact on the cardiovascular disease? We all know that HDL cholesterol is inversely proportional to the cardiovascular disease risk. That's why in the general population, its generic terminology is a beneficial cholesterol. But also we should know that there is no evidence so far from Mendelian randomization studies or randomized trials that use the setup inhibitors standing for cholesterol ester transfer protein like dacitrapib or anisitrapib that raising plasma HDL reduce the cardiovascular risk. However, HDL is still a useful marker in the risk estimation using the SCORE2 algorithm. So there is no evidence of raising HDL as a therapeutic target, but it is still used in the risk stratification process. The triglyceride has a strong dilemma regarding its role in the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We should admit that hypertriglyceridemia is a significant independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but still weaker than the impact of hypercholesterolemia. 
That's why some meta-analysis suggests that targeting triglycerides may reduce cardiovascular disease in certain subgroups like those with elevated triglycerides and reduced HDL, example the diabetic patients and those with metabolic syndrome. In patients with familiar hypercholesterolemia, we should not use a score 2 algorithm because they have a different process for risk stratification as cause of the higher cardiovascular risk, and those patients need to have a specific LDL thresholds and targets different from other patients irrespective of their estimated cardiovascular risk. Let's move to the blood pressure and the impact of hypertension. The randomized clinical trial shows that elevated blood pressure is of course a major cause for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and also non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And the elevated blood pressure is a risk factor for development of coronary artery disease, heart failure, AF, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and lower extremity arterial disease. So hypertension is a strong risk factor for a large disease spectrum. The risk of death from either coronary artery disease or stroke increase in a linear relationship from a baseline of systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeter mercury and baseline of diastolic blood pressure of 75 millimeter mercury. So going up with a blood pressure increase the risk of mortality from coronary artery disease and stroke. And as we mentioned in hypercholesterolemia, the absolute benefit of reducing systolic blood pressure depends on the absolute baseline risk and the absolute degree of reduction in systolic blood pressure. Except that lower limits sometimes are difficult to be achieved due to tolerability and safety consideration, especially in elderly population. And also the management is determined according to the category of hypertension defined according to seated office blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, or home-based blood pressure reading. If we speak about gender difference regarding hypertension, there is a clinical evidence that lifetime blood pressure evolution is different in gender, as in females it potentially results in an increased cardiovascular risk at lower blood pressure thresholds in comparison with men. And regarding the secondary hypertension, the SCORE2 algorithm cannot be used in this case as in rarer form of hypertension like Kahn syndrome or renal artery stenosis, so we apply this for the primary hypertension. Let's move to the cigarette smoking as a risk factor. Needless to say, of course, that cigarette smoking is responsible for 50% of all avoidable death in smokers with half of them due to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and the lifetime smoker has a 50% probability of dying due to smoking and on average may lose 10 years of life regarding life expectancy. And also, the cardiovascular risk in smokers less than 50 years of age is five-fold higher than in non-smoker. Of course, they are horrifying numbers that trying to put the facts in front of anyone who may mention that smoking is not as dangerous as we imagine. Worldwide, smoking is still the leading risk factor after high blood pressure for disability-adjusted life years due to the morbidity of cardiovascular disease. The second-hand smoking, like for example passive smoking, is associated with an increase in cardiovascular risk. Besides, the smokeless tobacco products is still associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, even if they are less than cigarette smoking, but still they have relatively higher cardiovascular risk. If we try to make a comparison between cigarette smoking and e-cigarettes like Vape, Juul, Icos, which are recent products that we usually hear about nowadays from many patients, in this case we should mention what did the CDC mention at the recommendations for e-cigarettes. They mentioned that e-cigarettes have the potential to benefit adults who smoke and they are not pregnant if they are used as a method for smoking cessation so they can be used as a substitute for those who are regular cigarette smokers or smokers of other tobacco products. But we should mention that they are not safe for youth, young adults, pregnant adults as well as adults who don't currently use tobacco products so we cannot advise e-cigarettes for non-smokers they may be used as a method for gradual smoking cessation. And while the e-cigarettes still have the potential to benefit some who are trying to stop smoking and harm others who try these new products, scientists still have a lot to do and a lot of research and trials in order to mention whether e-cigarettes are effective in helping adults quit smoking or not 
So if we make this comparison, we can mention that cigarettes have a significantly higher cardiovascular risk because we are not speaking only about nicotine, we are speaking about a lot of toxins that are being burned in the cigarettes, whereas in the e-cigarettes, they have a relatively lower cardiovascular risk than cigarettes, but still higher than non-smokers. Let's move to the famous risk factor, diabetes mellitus, a major health problem. Type 1 and type 2 and also pre-diabetes are independent risk factor of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. We all know this information. They increase the risk about twofold than in non-diabetic, depending of course on the population and the degree of therapeutic control. And the patients with type 2 diabetes are likely to have multiple risk factors. Usually they are not only diabetic, they may have also dyslipidemia and hypertension, which lead to more increase in the risk of both atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If we ask this famous question, is diabetes a coronary artery disease equivalent or not? At the diagnosis or those with short duration, diabetes is not considered to be a coronary artery disease equivalent, but the risk levels may approach the degree of being coronary artery risk equivalent after about a decade from diagnosis or those who develop some degree of proteinuria or diabetic nephropathy. And patients with diabetes and established coronary artery disease have a vascular risk which is significantly higher than those with coronary artery disease without diabetes and may have also lower life expectancy. This clarifies the big impact of diabetes on the cardiovascular risk or on the, on the burden of coronary artery disease. That's why diabetes has a different algorithm for risk stratification as we cannot use SCORE2 algorithm in diabetics. The last risk factor we are going to speak about today is adiposity. The Mendelian randomization analysis suggests a linear relationship between body mass index and cardiovascular mortality in non-smoker and a J-shaped relation in ever smokers. And all-cause mortality of course is lowest at the optimal body mass index of 20 to 25 in apparently healthy people. The body mass index and waist circumference are still strong risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So we should focus on the waist circumference besides the body mass index as important therapeutic targets. We usually hear a famous terminology called the obesity paradox. In heart failure patients, there is an evidence for obesity paradox that the mortality may be lower in those with higher body mass index because sometimes the low body mass index may be correlated with cardiac asphyxia, which may indicate higher mortality. But this evidence shouldn't be misinterpreted to recommend higher target body mass index for those with established cardiovascular disease because still there is a linear relationship between the increased body mass index and the cardiovascular mortality, but sometimes with a very low body mass index, we may see an opposite result. And this drags us to the point of the fitness, which is an important point to be considered because individuals who have normal body weight but they are unfit due to lack of regular exercise have higher cardiovascular risk than fit individuals regardless their body mass index. The overweight and the obese fit individuals because they are practicing regular aerobic exercise may have mortality risk similar to normal weight fit individuals and furthermore the results of the EPIC study suggested that the influence of physical inactivity or sedentary life on mortality appears to be greater than that of high body mass index. So when we speak about the adiposity we shouldn't miss the important point of fitness as an important parameter in risk stratification and the impact on cardiovascular disease. So at the end of this video, we have discussed today important risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and as being strong risk factors, they need to be clinically assessed in any patient as part of the risk stratification process through meticulous history taking, examination and investigation. So every one of them should be put in our minds during the process of risk stratification, whether it is present or not. Thank you very much for your watching and wait for the next video regarding risk modifiers.